first of all, I'd like to thank all of you very much for your generous donations to me. And I'd like to tell you what they're going to be used for. They're going to be used to continue the renovation and work on our new forest monastery in Germany. I think I've mentioned already that it's called Metta Vihara, which is a place for Metta to live, for loving kindness to live. And I have ha I've brought some photos of that place with me, and it's in a little photo album, which I have put on the table by the entrance to the dining room. That little table apparently is meant for me to sign books, but I'll sign them right at the place where I'm sitting in the dining room. I'm not going to make a, an official occasion out of that. <laughs> um, and that little table, I think, and that's up to the people who are doing that, uh, could be useful for handing out the last tapes. One doesn't have to sit out in the open doing that and can sit at that little table. At the moment, I've put the photo album there if you want to have a look. It says on it, Meta Vihara, Southern Germany, renovations inside and outside. We have so far been able to uh, renovate the um, ground floor and the first floor. We have uh, 12 bedrooms, including mine, including Nyana Bodhi's, and uh, another um, aspirant for monkhood. So there are um, nine bedrooms which people can use at the moment, nine, oh no, that's wrong, eight. Um, there's another girl that's coming with me. Eight bedrooms which hopefully, as of next year, are open for people who want to experience monastery on time, which is an expression we use for those who would like to join in in the monastic life but aren't ready to take the robes or ordain, in other words. At the moment, we're thinking that we can start um, with people coming for a minimum of one month so that we don't have uh, too many people coming in and out. Of course, people can stay longer. Since we have more than 1,000 tapes in English of my Dhamma talks. You're all extremely welcome to come. Not all at once, please. We only have eight bedrooms. <laughs> <laughs> and um, male and female alike. And um, I'll be there. I will be uh, dividing my time between a Buddha house and the new monastery. And so you can have interviews there and the place itself which you might be able to see from the photos I don't think that the photos actually can do it justice because it's still all in the preparation stage we're really working at it um, the place itself is in the foothills of the Alps it's um, 3,000 feet up 1,000 meters yes 3,000 feet up and on a clear day, you see the snow-covered Alps. There is uh, 20 acres, forest, a little stream, uh, meadows, and you can't see any other house from there. It's, um, it appears to be totally isolated. And yet it's only 20 minutes from the nearest railhead and the railhead is the main town in the southern Bavaria, Algoi, where we live. It's half an hour from Buddha House, which has been our seminar house or retreat center since 1989. We, uh, we think that as it is, it's already beautiful, but of course we are very much working on making it even better. At the moment, we don't have gardens yet, and I know <clears throat> that Nyanabodhi has been walking around these gardens taking notes. 
mental notes, I assume. <laughs> Not everything that grows here, we could grow there. We have very severe winters. We have uh, snow up to at least, well, I think six feet at times, not always. <laughs> and um, so we have to um, be sure that we only grow things which can stand that kind of climate. And of course, in Germany, you can get those plants that can stand the climate. They, um, the forest is mostly pine and they are, of course, uh, winter resistant. In fact, they like it. And you will see that on the photos, if you look at them, that the pine trees with the snow on them look like a fairy tale. Uh, snow can be very inconvenient. I often say that, well, it's inconvenient, isn't it? But it looks absolutely <laughs> wonderful. It's uh, very, very beautiful. It looks like a fairy tale of the Snow Queen, which I remember from my childhood. And so the, uh, the place itself, hopefully, will have that what we envision for it, namely a place where people can retreat from the world for a time. Naturally, those that want to ordain are also welcome there and retreat from the world for a time and find their way to their inner being and find it in such a way and so strongly that they never lose that way again. Because this is a great um, danger when you take a retreat like this, which is eight days, that you find your way in, but it doesn't stay open because there's so much that will confront you in daily life that your mind will get so busy that you forget to keep that passage open. It's only normal and natural. But once one has made that passage so secure that one can always get in there, one could assume that it would also remain open in the uh, daily activities, even when they become very busy. I thought I'd like to tell you about this and uh, invite you to have a look at the photos. And if you don't know what they mean, we're happy to explain. There's one that um, you won't recognize, and I'll tell you what it is. In the winter, when the snow is six feet high, we can't get in the last one and a half kilometers with a car, even with four wheel drive. So we have a snowmobile. And the snowmobile has a little trailer in the back. And there's one photo with the snowmobile and the trailer, and the trailer is bringing in my bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> so when you see that, you will know what that is. <laughs> Because all the material, everything that we needed, you will see a picture, a photo, which has um, uh, timber bringing in on, on, with a snowmobile. Everything that we needed during that time had to be brought in that way. Not very convenient, as I said before, but the scenery is absolutely astounding. It's um, something that you'll never see in California, I dare say. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly not in this part of California, maybe up north, I don't know. Um, we ha but we have icicles hanging from the roof that are um, six feet or more long. So that also looks quite amazing. <laughs> so I invite you to have a look at those photos and you will know that all the donations that you have given are going to be used to continue with the work there and make it into a place which is then open and available for people who take this path seriously and want to have a greater connection with that. And we believe that the place is very um, suitable for that. Obviously, you have to take quite a long trip. so. That's a drawback, isn't it? But maybe there are other uh, advantages.
I'd like to talk about what's going to happen now. Where do we go from here? We've had an intensive meditation retreat and I dare say most of you have either had new meditation experiences or come back to the ones you've had in the past or improved those that you've had. And with those meditation experiences, the calm and the insight have become a more settled aspect in one's inner being. Now, the calm, I already mentioned that, gets lost. The insight doesn't get lost, but it goes to the back of the mind, and it will only be available if you use it in daily living. If you've had insight into impermanence, you've got to use it. Don't put it away now in the back burner and say, I know everything's impermanent, it's fine. And keep on doing what you have been doing in the same way. You can do, it this, you can do the same things, but don't do them in the same way. Always have impermanence in your thoughts so that nothing becomes so important that you fall into the trap of absolutely wanting it or absolutely having to get rid of it. That's a trap, nothing else. Brings a great deal of unhappiness. So when you take the insights that you've had, whatever they may be, you may have had insight into dukkha, you may have had insight into compassion, whatever it may be, take it with you into daily life and use it. That means remembering, always bringing it up again. I said already, it's like speaking a foreign language. One day that foreign language becomes so familiar that you speak it as if it were your own. I learned English when I was 15, but I've been speaking it ever since. So I speak it as if it was my own. But if I hadn't, I wouldn't be able to. Of course, I didn't do that on purpose. Circumstances made me do that. But that's why I use foreign language as an example. I learned French for seven years in school, with very good notes, by the way. I can't put a sentence together. I haven't used it. But when somebody speaks French, it sounds familiar. And if it doesn't go too fast, I can make it out somehow. It's the same with insight. If you don't use it, you can make it out somehow. But it's not your own. So maybe you can remember that and try it out. So there are many helpmates that we have in daily life that we need to use in order to support spiritual life. A spiritual life can be lived anywhere, at any time, under any circumstances, even in prison. There's a prison ashram here in America. Um, it's a loosely knit organization that helps prisoners. And I get their information sheets, been corresponding with the people who run it for numbers of years. And they get letters from the prisoners who are behind bars in their cells and are practicing. And what it does for them, they voice that in their letters. So that's an extreme. I don't expect any of us to wind up in prison, but I'd like to just mention it because sometimes people say, not today, but when you come to the next course, they say, well, I haven't been able to practice. There's been that many things going on. I just can't do it. I went from here to there and uh, I had to change my job and I had to move my house and uh, the children were acting up 
and uh, my partner isn't doing it, uh, and there isn't any lack of justifications. But it can be done anywhere, at any time, under any circumstance. And the one who continues doing it, even under adverse circumstances, is the one who is using one of the characteristics that the Buddha really recommended, namely endurance. Patience is one, but endurance is another. And this life requires endurance. We've got to stick it out till we die. It doesn't matter how awful it gets in the meantime. We've got to be here with it. And we've got to make the best of it. And it's no use trying to imagine that it's wonderful. It has its ups and downs, like everything else. But we've got to endure. And the downs, when we endure them without any aversion, we don't suffer. We just know. So the one who practices under all circumstances is the one who has spiritual life at heart. The one who doesn't, who looks for the best circumstances, it's like, very much like monks and nuns looking for the best monastery or nunnery. There is no such thing. Wherever one goes, one takes one heart, one's heart and mind with one. And that's never the best. We can have to make do with it. So the one who doesn't practice under all circumstances is still not committed and should not be surprised when the meditation dissipates. It was very nice here, but nothing happens at home. It's a commitment, it's a feeling of the heart, it's a devotion, it's the care, the priority, all those things that count. Now, the commitment to the spiritual life has to be understood that it can be lived in the material life. As long as we have a body, we live in the material life. There's no way out of it. As long as we're really attached to this body, of course, the material life is very much a priority. But when we start seeing that the body is just a body, that's all it is, and it has its own whims and its own ideas of what goes on and does things that we don't want it to do. And it doesn't as appreciate it as we thought it ought to be. It's just the body. And if you can react to it in that way, that's a spiritual reaction. But if you feel bereft because the body isn't doing what you'd like it to do, and it isn't being appreciated the way you want it to be appreciated. That's a material life. Material life doesn't mean money. It does that too. But actually, every monastery needs money. Every center needs money. Everybody needs money. They've got to pay for the food that you buy. Even if you grow it yourself, there's always something you've got to buy. You've got to buy light bulbs, for instance. Well, if you haven't got light bulbs, you've got to buy candles. Or you've got to start making candles, or you've got to buy the wax for that. And there's no end of it. Everybody needs money. So it's not the money that makes life material. It's how you look at it and what you do with it and how you approach it. It's not in itself something that is not spiritual. Somebody told me a story and said that they were going to go to a center to have a self-retreat and they were asked what they'd like to drink for mo in the morning for breakfast <laughs> and uh, the person answered I'd like coffee and the one she was talking to said coffee you drink coffee <laughs> well yes she drinks coffee <laughs> and and so do I <laughs> 
it's not the money that's unspiritual. It's not the coffee that's unspiritual. It's one's own feeling within oneself what's important, what is at the top of every list that we make, how we react to it, for instance, if we don't get coffee, if we like coffee or tea or whatever, how do we react? Is it awful or is it okay? How do we react if we don't get the money that we should like to have? How do we react? Get worried, anxious, or, well, that's just the way it is. That's what counts. It isn't the thing itself. It's our own way of dealing with it. And the better we learn to deal with it, the less disturbances there are in our lives. In order to deal with these things on a spiritual level, we do have to meditate every single day. Now, I've said already that the insights have to be used, but the calm, the serenity, the tranquility, the jhanas, they have to be practiced. If we don't, and I mentioned it once before, and I mentioned it again, if we don't, we lose them. And many people, and some of you who are here, <coughs> have had that experience don't practice uh, diligently or you don't do them and they got, get lost can't get at them anymore but if you do them every day they are an integral part of your inner being and when they become an integral part of you then they are way of having a different consciousness is all through you, it imbues you from top to bottom. There is nothing that doesn't have that kind of connection. And when you have that kind of connection, you're a different person. Peacefulness, lack of um, this really deliberate search, and passionate search for finding contentment is eliminated. It doesn't mean being enlightened, it just means that everything is a little less, ex little less anxious, a little less restless, it's subdued, it's muted, and you get a taste of equanimity. There's nothing more wonderful than equanimity under all circumstances. Not only is the reaction easy, but also your knowledge, how life will progress for you, is another factor because you can rely upon yourself. Now, very few people can say that about themselves, that they can rely upon themselves. Not that they're going to be punctual, that's one thing. No, they can rely upon their emotional reactions. They can be totally reliable. They know exactly it's not going to throw them off the track, whatever happens. And that is a wonderful feeling. It's a feeling of security. Maybe... It's interesting, I don't know, to know that kema means security. And it's one of the many synonyms for Nibbana. And you get these names given at your ordination. That doesn't mean that you are that. <laughs> it just means that you are a preceptor, the, ones who orda the one who ordains you, hopes you might be one day. <laughs> <laughs> so kema means security in Pali a very famous nun in the Buddha's time. So this feeling that you are secure within yourself, you're totally reliable, you don't ha ever going to fly off the handle, is something that you can't get anywhere except through the meditative path of calm and insight. 
And at this point I would like to mention once again, calm is samatha, insight is vipassana, and that is what we hope to get, vipassana, but it isn't a particular method. It is just that we hope to get insight. And as we hope to get insight, it comes little by little. It doesn't come in one fell swoop. It comes little by little. And it expands if we use it. If we don't use it, it contracts. Every day meditating, once in the morning, once at night, one hour each time. That's a sort of traditional um, advice that's always given. If we are a um, complete beginner, if this has been the first course, and uh, sitting one hour is very difficult, there's nothing against getting up. After half an hour, stretching one's legs, sitting down again. It's also I don't even want to recommend that to do it half an hour. Make it, do it for an hour. And uh, if you have started with an hour, don't deduct. <laughs> Stick to it. Be your own teacher. Or be your own mother that says, now look, you committed yourself to an hour, come on, sit down and stay there. Every single moment that we stay on the pillow, we gain something. We make good karma, we have because of the repeated return to the meditation subject, we work against the sloth and torpor in the mind, we have purification each second that we're concentrated. We get to know our mind moments through labeling. And we realize that even though we think the meditation wasn't any good, after some time, we realize a change within ourselves. And sometimes it's even other people who say that or notice it. That's very gratifying, but don't wait for it. <laughs> Look at yourself and see whether your reactions are more subdued. Whether your reactions, which were quite um, passionate in the past, may even have disappeared in some instances. In other instances, they're not as passionate anymore. It's the best criteria to use. At home, you should have a little corner or a whole room or whatever you can spare for your meditation. Where you keep the pillow, have it lying there. There are two reasons for that. First of all, if you pass it during the day, it reminds you that in the evening you're supposed to go there again. And secondly, you don't have to look around all over the house, where did I put my pillow? We don't remove the chairs from the dining room. We don't remove the towels from the bathroom. We don't remove the pots and pans from the kitchen. So why remove the pillow from the sitting corner? Have it as a fixture in your house. Sometimes that works against one. It's lying there, the pillow. It's um, telling me that I actually intend to meditate and then the mind already veers off. With the intention, the act doesn't come together. <coughs> so beware of that. In that corner, in that meditation corner, you can have a Buddha statue, you can have a beautiful picture, you can have a vase with flowers, or you can have nothing, whatever you prefer. What you should have is a timer. A timer that you set for the appropriate time. And I have suggested one hour. Now if you think it's impossible, I can't do an hour, I just haven't got the time. 
okay, then start with whatever you think you have the time, but no less than half an hour. And then add to it, gradually, till you get an hour. Now with the timer, which is very important, sit until it rings. If you don't have a timer, and you sit there, the mind is very liable to say, hmm, well, I've been sitting all this time. I'm sure it's an hour. <laughs> and then you get up, and then you go in the kitchen, and all it was was 10 minutes. <laughs> and instead of going back, one of course makes coffee and toast. <laughs> so make sure you've got a timer. If you haven't got one, any alarm clock will do that doesn't tick. A ticking clock is dreadful. It's worse than, if, uh, than even traffic outside because it's so regular. But timers are available everywhere. That's actually all you need except yourself. But there are other support systems. Naturally, there are books, and we've talked about them, and how to read them, and how to use them. Use them in the best way possible. There is no a real benefit in just reading them. You've got to remember them, whatever you've read, and practice it. There are tapes to listen to, which are helpful. But one of the most helpful things that you can have are noble friends. Ananda, who was the Buddha's cousin and his attendant for 25 years, together with him all the time, once said to the Buddha, Sir, a good friend is half of the holy life. And the Buddha said, Do not say so, Ananda. A good friend is the whole of the holy life. Holy life you can translate into spiritual life. A good friend, a noble friend, is a person who also practices and supports your practice. In other words, if you want to get, go off to a meditation course, they don't say, oh, don't leave me alone. They say, oh, isn't that wonderful? And um, even if they themselves can't come, they are most favorably someone who has also been along this path and is one step ahead. Just one step. Because that person still remembers the step behind. And remembering the step behind has great empathy, great compassion when you stumble on that step behind and can be the support system to stand up straight again and continue. If you have somebody at home who also meditates, wonderful, do it together. One will remind the other to get up at, in time and having two there is a real support. None of you would have sat here as often and as long as you did if everybody else hadn't come also. And then you waited very nicely for the little gong to go, even though you might have not been concentrating. Well, do the same at home. Wait for the timer to go. But don't sit there with um, gritting your teeth and saying, well, isn't that thing going off now? What's the matter with it? Probably not working anymore. Get a new battery. <laughs> But just try to refurbish and re, uh, make it realize that your concentration comes. Just try again, that's all. Again and again. So if you're alone at home, you're the only meditator at home, you have to do that alone. It doesn't matter. Most people actually do, unless they live in a community where everybody meditates. But find your noble friends in a meditation group. I have put two bits of paper there on the wall, one for the people living in the Bay Area, 
where there's a group that Lee will facilitate and has been facilitating and there's a group in the San Diego area and particularly of those who have been students of mine where in those groups uh, tapes will be played of um, talks, loving kindness tapes and you have find your noble friends there who are supporting your practice. Because even though meditation is now a word that is being heard and written and talked about in many, many places, it's still an absolute minority that's practicing it. Just because we're sitting here together and just because there are something like 40 people living here doesn't mean that the rest of San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley and so on is meditating. Nothing like it. And what to say of the under, other 260 million Americans? And what to say of the other 6 billion people on this planet? Some of whom have never heard the word meditation and even those that have heard it have no intention of doing it. So when you get out in the world which means you go to your job and um, do whatever you need to do in your daily life, you're most likely to meet only people who have nothing to do with meditation, who don't even know what it means to live a spiritual life, who think everything is fine the way it is, or who think everything is terrible the way it is, but don't know what to do about it. So there's no support system there. On the contrary, there was one question one evening where somebody wrote that people have been asking her, I'm presuming it's a her, um, why she's meditating, she seems to be quite stable. <laughs> so people think you must be a little bit nuts if you're meditating. It's not uncommon, this thought. It's, uh, there must be something wrong with you. You want to meditate, there must be something wrong with you. So that kind of attitude, of course, is also liable to take you off the path because you meet so many more people who have either no interest at all or that attitude. That's why you urgently need a group to go to. Two people are a group. So if you live somewhere, not in the San Diego area, nor in the Bay Area, nor anywhere where there is a group or a center such as this where you could go, make a group. Offer yourself to people whom you know who might be interested. Don't do missionary work. That doesn't work. But an offer might very often bring surprising results. And if you see that there is somebody, have a group of two. In Germany, where I arrived in 1989, there weren't any groups. So I kept saying this. So after courses at the end. So people started having groups of two and then three and then four and then five and some of them are regular 10, regular 12, regular 15 and most of them have eventually found their way to a meditation course. So it's got to start somewhere. So if you are somewhere where there's nobody around that has a group, there's no center, nothing at all, you do it. Somebody's got to start. And you know, it's always true. There's always one person that starts things. And it's not a good idea to leave it to somebody else. There's a very famous saying, which I'm just trying to translate into English, <laughs> by Rabbi Hillel, who was alive in the first century of our time, was a rabbi in the uh, temple in Jerusalem who got destroyed in 70 AD. And his very most famous saying is, 
If not me, who then? If not now, when? And it's the one thing that we should actually take to heart. If not me, who? If not now, when? It's up to each one. And taking responsibility, not only for oneself in this case, as I've mentioned before, but for the emanations that touch the people around one, means that one has actually understood what's going on in one's mind. The whole of the universe has mind at its center. It's consciousness. What kind of consciousness are we putting out? Start a group, go to a group, and do it regular. And don't, after having lost the inspiration of the course, start dragging your heels. It's the, the usual uh, thing that happens, except for a few people. When the inspiration of the course where you were doing very well and when everything was geared towards meditation, calm and insight, when that has um, sort of dissipated, is no longer strong, then your own determination dissipates. Don't allow it. Be aware that this will stop you in your tracks. Another thing which I think it might be uh, appropriate here. I've never seen these um, meditation sheets in anywhere with so many different teachers mentioned. People do go to two or three, but here I had sheets that had ten, mm -hmm. ten different names. And there's no harm, not at all, in going to different teachers. The harm which can result is in comparing, in judging, in not doing what one is told to do because one has heard something else, or in switching one's practice from one thing to the next. And then, in the end, not knowing anymore what one should do because one has switched so often. Now, going to a meditation retreat with different teachers is fine. But one should definitely have one main teacher and one main practice. The main teacher is because there's love, devotion, gratitude involved. Without that, the meditation doesn't work very well. Life doesn't work very well. Love, devotion, and gratitude. And the one practice, which is the main practice, is like digging a well in one spot. If one keeps on digging in many spots, one may never find water. But there is underground water. So one has to keep on digging till one hits it. And one is much better off using one's time and energy in that one spot. Which is not to say at all that other practices are worse or not, not worthwhile, or wrong, nothing like it. But keep to one. Do one mainly. You can try out the others, there's not no harm in that. But have one as your main practice. And you choose it. It doesn't matter. Whatever you choose, that's the one you're going to do. And then, it's like climbing that mountain that I've already mentioned. Keep on one path. It's no use jumping around from one path to the next. The, uh, the time and energy wasted is enormous. Being a part of a group supports one's own practice. We support the group. We don't forget what is important for us. We have the noble friend. The noble friends are also people that we can be totally honest with. They can be totally honest with us. They are those that help us on the path. They are those that have um, 
a feeling for what we're doing and thereby have great compassion for us and we have compassion for them. There are many other things that noble friends are meant to be. They're supposed to be not just our mentors, but they're supposed to be the kind of people that we can actually rely on. In order to have them, we've got to be one. If we are a noble friend, we will have noble friends. This is an important support system in everyday life. Your daily meditation, the group, the noble friends, and then mindfulness. Being here now. No results, no achievements, even though our whole culture says the opposite. Our culture is supporting and always will support result and achievement. Look at it. Does it make anybody happy? What we do when we are on a spiritual path is give our very best. What is our very best? We give ourselves. We don't hold anything back. There's a discourse by the Buddha where he uses the simile of an elephant that goes to war. Now in the days of the Buddha, the elephant was taking the place of a tank. And they were the most important and strongest a war machine that was available. And the simile he's using is that if the elephant is trying to protect his hide, he's not an elephant that will help the king. If he is trying to protect his trunk, he's not an elephant that will be really a, a good support for the king and his country. If he's trying to protect his head, he's not a good support. He has to give himself fully to the matter at hand, which is life-threatening because the simile of war is used. has to give his whole body, his whole being, to that which is happening. Then he is a real support for the king and his country. This is what we need to do with the spiritual path. This is what we need to do with our meditation. That's what we need to do with mindfulness. Give ourselves to it fully. And not hold back and say, well, I'll be mindful tomorrow. Or I don't really know how to be mindful. There's so much going on. Or whatever excuse we can find, just be it. Being mindful means attention. Bear attention without judgment. Mindfulness does not judge. It's knowing only, exactly. That what judges is called clear comprehension. And it's very often mentioned in the suttas in conjunction with mindfulness. Mindfulness and clear comprehension. Sati, which is mindfulness, and Sampayanya. Sampajanya is the clear comprehension of what we know. So when we comprehend that that what we're doing, saying, thinking is unwholesome, we substitute. Unless we do that in daily life, we haven't got a spiritual path. We've got to substitute. Now obviously we're not always going to be able to. Sometimes the emotion is so strong that we can't get away from it immediately. I've already told you what to do. Take an intermediate step. Substitute not with the opposite, but with something which will calm the mind. Anything at all. Stick your nose into some flowers and smell them, or whatever. It doesn't matter just so that the mind gets away from the negativity. The substitution of the unwholesome with the wholesome is our entry ticket to spirituality. 
where you do it, in the office, at home, in the traffic, on the parking lot, <coughs> it doesn't matter. Always do it, wherever. Naturally, sometimes it's easy because it's a minor emotion. And sometimes it's very difficult. The easy things are always done first, but we've done the easy things for many, many years. In fact, we've had it much too easy. Our society is one that presses buttons and everything happens. Washing machines, television, telephones, radios, dishwashing machines. Everything is with buttons, electric light, buttons all over the place. When the electricity goes out, terrible, isn't it? No buttons to push. The, that is not what we need to learn, to have it easy. We know that already. We've been practicing that for years on end. What we need to learn is to do that which is difficult. So when a very unwholesome thought, very unwholesome emotion arises, and it's difficult to let go, that's when the practice is really worthwhile. That's when we really have to be patient with ourselves and endure. Actually, the mind likes to veer off its dukkha. I don't want any part of it. Well, but that's practice. Practice is enhanced through meditation. But practice is in daily life as simple as that. Substituting the unwholesome with the wholesome. And if you've done it a few times, you gain confidence in your ability to do it. And you also gain the personal knowledge of the beautiful results which ensue. The mind which was before beset by some craving or by some hate now becomes calm and at ease. Well, isn't that worth trying all the time? Those are the foundations of mindfulness, the emotions, the thoughts, and then we have the one we have spoken about the least, and that's the third one, our moods, our underlying moods. If you have become aware of a certain underlying mood, which is negative, then work with that, because the mood will be the generator of thought and emotion. So whatever the underlying mood is, is an important aspect of your inner being. <coughs> Mindfulness means nothing other than watching oneself. Watching so that nothing untoward goes on, so that we don't make bad karma, <coughs> so that we don't hurt either ourselves or others. And clear comprehension is an important aspect to go with that. And I will briefly explain it. It has as its first component the investigation, why am I thinking what I'm thinking? What is the purpose? What am I saying? What is the purpose? And what am I doing? What's the purpose? Whatever it happens to be think, say, or do. Those three are our three gateways, our three doors through which we can act. It's a thought, the word, and the action. Only those three are how we manifest. Now the first inquiry is, what's my purpose? And when you have ascertained that you have a certain purpose, you're not just sort of dithering, but you have a purpose, then the next inquiry is, is that what I intend to say or do 
the most skillful means for attaining my purpose. If you again answer, yes, those are the most skillful means, then the third inquiry is, and are the purpose and the means within the Dhamma? Would the Buddha have said or done it? It's a very interesting question. And if the answer is again yes, then go ahead and do it. And then the fourth inquiry is, did I actually obtain the purpose that I was doing all this for? And if not, why not? Now you can see that this will preempt impulsive action and it will slow one down which is only for the good. Impulsive action and instinctive action or impulsive words or instinctive words are often regretted immediately after they've happened. We've all had that, that experience that we might have said something and immediately when we've said it, we regretted it. Because first of all, it didn't express what we really felt and we could see that we were at loggerheads with the person we're talking to and didn't really want to be. That's why this inquiry into clear comprehension, four steps, is the companion of mindfulness. Mindfulness is knowing, clear comprehension is inquiry. And we don't have to be quick. That's another notion that has somehow made its way into our society that fastness is goodness. Do you believe it? find out. We don't have to be quick. Where are we going to so quickly? We're all going to the same place, the cemetery. <laughs> so why hurry? There's plenty of time. It doesn't all have to happen at once. And living in a place which is surrounded by nature and where the uh, demands of society are not quite as apparent as they are in the middle of the city is a big help. If you have to live in the middle of the city, you have to make the best of it. But living outside of the um, great metropolis and being more surrounded by nature, that which really is part of ourselves is helpful. I mean, it's very difficult to become part of a freeway. In fact, I wouldn't ad advise it at all. <laughs> but it's very, very nice and extremely helpful to be part of a tree and have that feeling that the tree and myself are both doing the same thing. They're just standing there and the tree is providing shade and I'm just standing there providing peace. It's the same thing. It's a very nice feeling. So mindfulness and clear comprehension belong together and we there are enormous support systems for our daily life. And the other thing that we have as a support system, we had our daily meditation we have the noble friends joining a group and having these friends we have the mindfulness and clear comprehension and we have the precepts. The precepts are a guideline to let go of the worst of our greed and hate. The most the easiest to see and the most destructive. 
there are five of those and these five are avoiding letting go of certain things but they also entail doing the opposite the first one is not to kill living beings and how we operate with that one in the garden is up to each person we are beset by snails in our garden so what we do is we collect them and then deport them <laughs> and hope because they're so slow that they're not going to come back so soon <laughs> that's just an example I mean we couldn't possibly kill them but they don't have to live in our garden they could live in the forest it's quite nice in the forest nearby <laughs> And so it goes with all those things that surround us, with flies and mosquitoes. In fact, uh, some of the people living at Buddha House have become extremely efficient in catching flies with their hands and then taking them out the window. I myself haven't been able to do that, but several of them do this extremely well. So it's the same same thing everybody has to make up their own mind how they're going to do this not to kill living beings but the opposite of that is love and compassion for living beings and I think we have talked about that sufficiently the love that we can generate in our hearts first we become aware of that which is already there the love that we have for certain people and then we try to extend and expand and as we try to expand and extend our love it becomes our natural way of feeling and when it's our natural way of feeling obviously other people have the benefit but we ourselves gain the greatest benefit so that's the opposite of that first one now the second one not to take anything that wasn't given well of course on a gross basis that means not to steal but that's already um, an extreme it means looking after other people's belongings just as well or better than after one's own and it also means giving instead of taking and being generous and you've all practiced that is a way of minimizing the egocentricity and having more of a feeling of togetherness manifesting the togetherness through giving now giving exists in many different uh, ways we can give talents we can give time we can give sympathy, we can listen to people and have empathy with them. We can give them love and compassion. We can give material things, we can give money. There's so much we can give. We all have inner and outer resources. And when we know that in this whole creation when one part of creation is unhappy the rest of creation suffers then we will always be on the lookout where we can remedy if we can some suffering in some way now we know that there are many people on this planet who suffer through not having through lacking the most essential ingredients for their lives and we all suffer from it even though we may not be aware of that we're all in it together the suffering that is existing extends everywhere 
And the help that is given also extends everywhere. We have the wrong notion that this is all very personal and very limited by our me and you idea, but it's not. It's all of it happens universally. The Buddha put dana, generosity, at the top of the list of the um, virtues because it opens the way to the um, manifestation of togetherness. He also said that there are three ways of being generous. The first way is the kind of generosity that a beggar has. That means giving away what one doesn't want anyway. That's not generosity, it's just getting rid of stuff. Then there's a second kind, that's sharing, that's the generosity of a friend, sharing with others. And that's a manifestation of togetherness. And then there's a generosity of a king, which means giving away more than one keeps. It's very rare, and such people often become famous, even though they don't want to, because it is so rare. But it is the greatest generosity, and it is actually in one of the Jataka tales, which are supposed to, supposed to be the tales of former lifetimes of the Buddha. And whether they are or not, one doesn't really know. But there's certainly something like Aesop's fables. They are stories with morality in them. So there is actually there one of the stories where the then Bodhisattva gave his life to some to a tigress who didn't have enough milk for her cubs because she'd been so hungry. So then, having given his life, she was able to have milk for her cubs. So that is considered to be the epitome of generosity. It's not likely that we would practice that, but we certainly can know about it because then we will not look upon our generosity as something special, but just see it as a necessity in this whole of creation to be together. <coughs> the third one is to avoid sexual misconduct, which means the opposite, that we are responsible that we are faithful, that we realize that hurting another person physically or emotionally is not our aim in life, that it will only come back to us ourselves as a very unfortunate karmic resultant. And not being faithful does not mean freedom. Freedom means something entirely different. Freedom means that we realize absolute truth. So, I think we have got away from that notion anyway. It was quite prevalent in the uh, 70s and early 80s. I think we've done with it. There is a vestige of it still around, but uh, it isn't quite as heavy anymore. It means that we are faithful and responsible uh, towards the people that we deal with, not necessarily only a sexual partner, because we have other people that we need to deal with. And we are faithful to our friends, to our relations. We have a feeling of being a support system for these people. The next one is to avoid lying and harsh words and setting people one against each other. Well, obviously, the uh, antidote is right speech. And the Buddha said a lot about right speech because usually, other than in a meditation course such as this, we do talk a lot. So speech is a um, big part of our lives. 
So he said um, many things about it. And one of them is that when we actually want to help somebody and tell them something, we should never do it while we have the idea that they are neither as clever nor as loving as we are ourselves. When we do talk to another person about some important aspect, we must have complete feeling of togetherness and lovingness with that person. If there's any kind of aversion, rejection, or superiority feeling, or even inferiority feeling, then the speech is better avoided. You also said that one should learn the Dhamma in one's mother tongue, because the mother tongue is not just words, but one has learned it at the knee of one's mother, even though one doesn't remember that, and there are feelings behind the words. So with the feelings behind the words, one has a much better uh, chance of actually recognizing what the word means. Because basically, a word is just put together out of different letters. But when it is one's mother tongue that one hears it in, there is a deep meaning behind it. He also said that the Dhamma should be taught explicitly, just as he did. And he also said that right speech creates friendship, and friendship creates love. So it is something that we can (coughs) practice when we use (coughs) mindfulness together with clear comprehension. Why am I going to say what I want to say? Is it really skillful? Is it within the Dhamma? And if I say yes to all that, did I accomplish the purpose I had in mind? I'm sure you can all remember occasions when the speech that you did, that you thought was perfectly all right, accomplished exactly the opposite of what you had in mind. We all have that experience. We want to tell them what's what, and what happens, they tell us what's what. And the last one is no alcohol or drugs because they confuse the mind even more than it is already confused. Opposite of that is mindfulness. Now, obviously, there's always a question and we have that question in Germany and Bavaria to a great extent because beer in Bavaria is like bread on the morning table. Not even a little bit? (coughs) No, not even a little bit. But everybody has to make up their mind themselves. The Buddha said, no alcohol, no drugs. That doesn't mean medicine. It just means mind-altering drugs. Fermented substances, he called it. But for us, it's alcohol and drugs. And nowadays, we we can maybe recognize the one and maybe we don't recognize the other but we do know that alcohol has created great tragedies so we don't have enough dukkha as it is we don't have to add to it so these are the guidelines the Buddha gave obviously killing and uh, wrong speech come out of hate. Taking what's not given and sexual misconduct come out of greed and so does alcohol and drugs. So they are against hate and greed not to follow those and not to um, practice them but they're opposites. They are worded I undertake the training So the Buddha was quite realistic in his understanding that we need to train ourselves to do that. Eventually that becomes habitual. But in the beginning one has to remember. One has to train again and again not to fall into the traps 
of these particular uh, difficulties. What we're going to do in a moment is we're going to take refuge and precepts for those of you who'd like to. This is by no means compulsory. You do whatever you like. It's voluntary. Now I've explained the precepts and I'll explain how we take them in a minute, but I want to uh, uh, explain refuge. The refuge that we take is in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, and we call them the Three Jewels. And it's a refuge which brings safety and security. It brings safety and security because we also say the Dhamma protects the Dhamma practitioner. How? Why? Because the Dhamma is the protection that we have of not doing anything that is harmful. Naturally, these are training methods of training ourselves. In the world, we look for some security. Our insurance companies have usually the biggest buildings. People want to buy security. And then when they want to get it, they find out it wasn't what they thought it was going to be. You can't buy security. The opposite of security is anxiety, fear. And that is everywhere. Fear of having that happen which we don't want to have. But when we take refuge in the highest ideal, we take first of all refuge in the enlightenment principle which the Buddha embodies. <coughs> Buddha is not a name. Buddha means enlightened one. It's an, a description. And we certainly don't take refuge in a statue we take refuge in the enlightenment principle which is to be found in all human beings' hearts, including our own. And when we take refuge, it means that we know that we can actually evolve and cultivate that enlightenment principle to the point where we ourselves personify it. It's a feeling of a commitment, emulation, and a feeling of having the greatest ideal, the highest ideal that's possible as our goal. Not those intermediate things of being all right in the world. Because they produce anxiety. Am I going to be all right or am I not going to be all right? Can I do it or can't I do it? Is somebody going to put a spanner in the works? They usually do, because they're also on the way trying to get it pleasant in the world. So there's always something that isn't quite the way we'd like it to be. In that connection, I always tell the story of my granddaughter. She was screaming her head off, and I couldn't see any reason why. It was four and a half. It's five now. I said to her, Sarah, why are you screaming? And she said, nothing works the way it's supposed to. I said, you're absolutely correct. Nothing works the way it's supposed to. But is screaming helping? We're all screaming. Not quite as loud as she did. <laughs> but of course it doesn't work the way it's supposed to. We haven't got a security blanket that's going to make it work the way we want it. That's why security in the refuge is the one and only security that can never fail us. The enlightenment principle will not die, it will not move away, it will not change its mind, it will not want anything for itself, it's only there to protect us from evil. The second thing we take refuge in is the Dhamma, the teaching, the great teaching of the Buddha. 
the um, absolute truth, the law of nature, whichever way you'd like to translate that. Having that as one's immediate commitment and av availability, and it's there for us, makes everything else seem unimportant. We still do everything else, but it's not so important anymore. Living the Dhamma, that's what's important. Naturally, we can't quite do it yet, but our love for it and our devotion to it bring a feeling into the heart which give us stability inner stability, something very hard to come by in this world that we live in, where everything is moving all the time and supposed to be bigger, better and faster. We know very well that we are neither bigger nor better nor faster. We just are as we are. And the third uh, refuge is the Sangha. The Sangha, in this case, are the enlightened people who have been able to transmit the Dhamma to us and great gratitude in the heart that this is so. Since the time of the Buddha, there have always been teachers and are today. Not just preachers, but teachers. And that makes all the difference. And the enlightened Sangha, not necessarily ordained, has nothing to do with it, the enlightened Sangha in this case are the people that have actually lived the Dhamma to its end and if they do at the end they become ordained and have been able to pass that on and be the shining example. Now if we have that as our refuge we have something which goes far beyond the worldly activities and the mental activities that are out there. We still have to go out there and do it, but we don't have to think it's a priority. If you want to take refuge and the precepts, it means that it's a commitment, a devotion. And as we go out there into the world today, and as we leave this place, it's going to be pretty hectic. All sorts of cars and vehicles on the freeway. There's a lot of activity everywhere. And my only advice in that respect is, do it slowly. If you're driving, very slowly. And if they're all hooting and hooting from behind, never mind. <laughs> Speed is never going to do it. Mindfulness will. Just be slow. Don't try to uh, go faster than your present state of mind allows. One of the things that very often comes up for people is they get on the freeway, everybody is rushing here and there, and the mind says, goodness, where are they all going? It's amazing. They're all going somewhere. And that lasts about two days. And on the third day, you don't even notice that you just want to get in the right lane. <laughs> A mind changes from practice. And that's why we have to keep at that practice. I was sent a picture postcard not long ago and there was um, three words on it and in the first instance the word was written um, like a childish handwriting. Second uh, time it, the same word was written in a quite a better handwriting and the third time it was written in a mature handwriting and all it said was practice, practice, practice. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice picture postcard. Before we actually take refuge in precepts, I 
also like to explain to you the symbolism of what you find on a shrine. In the Zen practice, the shrine is very similar to ours. And what you find is, of course, a Buddha statue, as you see it here, and the Buddha statue is always dependent upon the artist who's made it. So there are many different ways of depicting the Buddha, and the artist has his own feeling and commitment. The different hand movements that the Buddha statues have, in our tradition we use five different ones, they're called mudras, and in other traditions there are many more. The five different mudras that are used in our tradition are the meditative one where the hands are on top of each other, then there's the teaching one where there's a, uh, the wheel of the Dhamma, then there's the protection one, nothing to fear, then there's the uh, the one with the open palm, usually the left open palm, hanging down over the knee, which is no secrets, having uh, taught, the Buddha taught with an open hand, and then there's the other way around with the uh, hand touching the ground, which is ask, uh, telling the earth to be witness to the enlightenment of the Buddha. These five are used, the most common, one, common ones are usually the meditative stance, but in standing and um, I think this one is no fear, I can't quite see. It's a, if it's a handout like that, it's protection from the Dhamma. But the things we have on a shrine, other than the statue, are flowers. And they're not there just to make it look pretty. That they do that. They can't help but do that. Flowers are just there, and they do make it pretty, but they are depicting impermanence. And every second day, or even every day, they have to be thrown on the compost heap. And that's supposed to remind us that that's where we are going. And we look pretty now, but then we only look ready for the compost heap in the end. <laughs> <laughs> then we have a candle, very often two, it doesn't matter. And the light of the candle is a symbolism for the light in the mind, which is enlightenment. Enlightenment is the mind which has seen through all the things that we project, has left our projections behind, and is totally clear. And the light of the candle is a symbolism for that. And then we have usually a three of the incense sticks. And they're not just there to make it smell better. They have a symbolism that as the beautiful aroma of the incense sticks can go a long distance the same goes for the beautiful aroma of a totally virtuous person. So we usually, in our tradition, don't use incense sticks during our meditative practice so that that particular sense contact is not engaged, the smelling. But we use it when we take refuge in precept because we are then committing ourselves to virtuous life. And again, it's a training. We undertake the training. Now, in order to do it, we hold the hands in what we call Anjali, which is the usual um, posture even in greeting people in Asia. And it is a very lovely posture because it means it's coming from my heart. So we have that kind of greeting, but we also use it for taking refuge and precept, 
we use it when we chant. I will chant the sight in Pali and then say it in English. And then those of you who want to can repeat it after me in English. There's no need to learn Pali in these five minutes. <laughs> but the traditional way of chanting is in Pali and so it is part of this tradition. The language that the Buddha spoke, which is a dead language now, but has, when it is recited, a certain rhythm which we can't reproduce, or at least not really well, in our languages. So I will just say it in English, and then you can repeat it after me. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa buddhang saranam gachami I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge Dhammang saranam gachami I take refuge in the Dhamma. Sanghang saranang gachami. I take refuge in the Sangha. Do te ampi buddhang saranang gachami. For the second time. I take refuge in the Buddha. For the second time, I take refuge in the Buddha. For the second time, I take refuge in the Buddha. 